Welcome to the Business of Being You podcast, a podcast about authenticity and the different ways people choose to be authentic. My name is Marco Benitez, also known as Coach Marco B. I'm very excited to have this uh, episode today, this conversation. Today's topic is unlikely encounters and how they can change your life and others. I'm really excited to have my guest today. Uh, she's one of my favorite people in the whole world. Her name is Liz Gannon Graydon. Uh, she's a very, very uh, longtime friend. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about her. So Liz Gannon Graydon is co-founder and president of What Better Looks Like, a nonprofit organization that taps into the creative potential of people to help solve problems in their local communities. She's also the national chair for the Peace Alliance, whose work revolves around uh, shifting to a culture of peace. And she also started what she calls her tea party, which is held in Bryant Park. And that's going to be uh, a big part of our of the the route around our conversation today. Um, so welcome, Miss uh, Liz Gannon Grader. Nice. Nice to see you, Marco. We've had so many beautiful conversations over the years, and I'm looking forward to this one. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the topic for today is unlikely encounters and, and how they can change your life and others. And yeah. we ran into each other after many years, uh, maybe about a year or two ago at a cafe, and you were sharing what you were doing with the, right. the tea party. Um, it just seems like such a simple thing to do. But in today's society, and, and especially in New York, it's such an uncommon thing to do. Um, first, tell me a little bit about it, and uh, then we'll get into a little bit more of the background, how it got started. Yeah, basically, we, um, for nine years now, Marco, <laughs> for nine years, um, generally on Thursdays, weather permitting, uh, I hold a tea party in Bryant Park which is one for those of you who aren't new yorkers it's it's one block away from times square it's really in the crossroads of new york city it's in the heart of the city and i pack about 30 cups and it's it started out as my mother's and grandmother's china but i've had donations from many people over the years i pack up china cups i put down tablecloths i bake fresh goods myself an assortment that are usually seasonal and i bring tea and we have a tea party. And it's funny, we usually start around noon and in warm weather, we go till the park closes nine or 10 at night. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. So, so yeah. how did this get started? I can tell you the way um, the event started and then how the tea party started. Mm -hmm. I made a decision to homeschool my own kids and it was back in 2014. It was the, I, I was just looking for free things to do with my kids in the city. And on Thursdays in the summers in Bryant Park, they have something called Broadway and Bryant Park. And basically what they do is there's a stage and the actual Broadway stars come and they sing and they perform for an hour at lunchtime. And so I put it out on Facebook and I just said, I'm gonna pack a lunch. I'm going to be in Bryant Park if anyone wants to come. And people showed up. And I think it was five or six weeks in a row we were there. And I thought, well, when the summer ends, I'm going to have to stop doing it. But because I homeschool my boys, I could adjust the schedule. And so we just kind of committed as long as the weather was okay, we were going to still do this once a week. Right. But the shift happened uh, at the end of the summer, the beginning of the fall. And it was one of those nights when you first feel that chill that where you know fall is yeah. coming. Yeah. And a couple of my friends went to get coffee. They went to get cups of coffee. And one of the women who was sitting with me said, ah, you know what? I really prefer tea. I said, I do too. I'm a tea drinker. And she said, but I only like drinking tea out of a real China cup. Mm. And we had all been meeting weekly. And I said, you know what? I have all these cups that were my mother's and grandmother's and I never use them. They sit in a cabinet. So I said, next week, I'll pack two cups. I'll bring a thermos of tea and we'll just have a little tea part. You know, we'll just have tea in the park. Right. And as I was getting ready, I thought I had these really beautiful, a friend had given me um, really big linen napkins. And I thought, oh, I can put those down on the table. And I thought if I'm bringing two cups, I may as well bring four because you don't know if someone else is going to show up. <laughs> right. And I thought, and I'll make a blueberry bread and I'll just bring it. And we were sitting there, Marco. And and do you are you familiar with Brian Park? I yeah, know well, a you few know. Times. Okay. So in the summertime, it gets really crowded. And it was still the end of the summer and it was lunchtime. 
And there was a gentleman sitting next to us and he was trying to eat his lunch on his lap because there were no free tables. And we had room at the table. So I just asked if he wanted to join us. And it turned out he spoke not one word of English. I said, thank goodness for uh, Google Translate. He was an actor and he was in from Turkey. And thing is, he was an actor in Turkey. And he said, but if you want to be an actor, you need to come to New York. So he had auditioned for a school here in New York. He got in, cool. um, but but he couldn't act in English yet. So during the days he was going to English classes and at night he was taking his acting classes. So he asked, we were talking and it was a lot. This is the first unexpected encounter. Right? I didn't know that was where. So it was an unexpected encounter that started the whole thing. Right. And so I asked him if he had a favorite actor and he said, yes, Al Pacino. And I went, me too. Oh my God, I love Al Pacino. So there was that commonality right, right there. Yeah. And so he asked if I had ever had Turkish tea. And I said, not that I know of. And my friend said, well, come next week and bring some Turkish tea. We'll be here next week. And he said, next week. And she said, yes. And he said, can I bring my friends? And he brought his whole class. There were like 10 or 12 of them from his English wow. as a second language class. And they came and it was fun. And and so that was the beginning of the tea party. That's simple. And it, yeah, it was that simple. But at the same time, it's where the intentionality shifted. At the same time, and we can go back into this. I know you want to talk a little bit about background. My father who had been a college professor and an activist in the 60s, started to delve into um, Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And he had always taught me about the beloved community, right? That was a really important concept. And it was an idea that he got from Martin Luther King. And so as he started to go into Alzheimer's and we would gather every week, I decided what had started kind of unintentionally in this very simple way, I was going to do intentionally for as long as I could as an exercise almost in beloved community uh, to honor my dad. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, what I find most interesting is that, you know, something like this, which became a thing and eventually became something more powerful and influential, not just for yourself, but also for the people in whom you engage with, is that it didn't take a lot of planning. It was a very casual, it was a very casual kind of passing comment. Yeah. And I found that myself in my life in that, you know, I think this, what did they say? I, it was a quote a long time ago, a long time ago. It's just something like, you know, when, when God speaks to you, he doesn't roar like a lion. He yeah. whispers, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. he whispers in the wind or something like that. Oh, um, that's beautiful. And, and I feel that that, that's just another example which you share that that's another example of how that happens it was just very casual like do you want to do this yes sure let's do it yeah you know, and and it also brings to mind some of these um how opportunities work how opportunity mm -hmm. knocks opportunity is not you know the 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 IRS knocking at your door <laughs> or someone trying to get you you know when when uh, you borrow the lawnmower you to return it you know, yeah. sometimes opportunity knocks, you know, the way Amazon knocks during the holidays. It's like drop the package <laughs> ding and if you're Oh my there, God, I love that. You know, yeah. you drop the package ding and if you don't come on time, someone's going to snatch it. <laughs> you know? Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. So, yeah. so that's really yeah. interesting. So when did you really start to feel like it was really starting to take off? Like this was, this was like, because when we spoke yeah. about this before, it, it was more of something like, sure, why not? Yep. And then it seemed to turn into something like, I need to continue to do this. Yeah, I, it became, well, it just was fun, mm -hmm. right? So uh, the first few years, so 2014, 15, 16, and 17, right? It, it was just fun. Right. And I would go, we would go as long as the weather permitted. And then something really um, powerful happened in the, in the middle of 2017, a woman was walking by and she said, I see you here regularly again, right? Those encounters. Right. And, and can you just tell me what's going on? And it turns out she worked at the park mm. and she said, wow. She said, do you think I could give your phone number to our uh, PR department? Yes. Um, yes. Cause they maybe might want to connect with you. Yeah. And so I, I talked to the gentleman who runs the runs their PR department. And he said, I have a friend or I, I, I have a contact at the New York Times. 
uh, who does feature stories. And I think he might be interested in this. Would you be willing to talk to him? So I said, sure. And Marco, it was so interesting to me. I talked to the gentleman, a lovely, uh, a lovely guy. His name is Corey Kilgannon. Oh. And we talked on the phone a couple of times and he showed up and he said he was going to have a photographer. He was going to talk to us for a little bit. And I thought he was maybe going to stay for a few minutes, take a few pictures. And he ended up staying the whole afternoon. He stayed for a few hours. Oh. And it was in October. It was in October of 2017. And he said he would let me know when they were publishing it. And it, he didn't contact me. He didn't contact me. And I thought maybe, maybe they decided not to use it. It's not a time sensitive story. And then he reached out to me, Marco. I don't know that I ever told this part of the story to you. He reached out to me and he said, I want to tell you, it seems like it's this time of year because around December we, would wrap it up right. uh, until spring. And he said, I had to try to tell the story in a way that was true, but didn't make it sound as good as it is because you would be so inundated with people and it would get ruined. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and he said, so I'm just going to say this to you. I'm going to publish it as close to the end of the year as I can. And you'll get a rush of people. But then when you come back in the spring, the people who are supposed to be there will show up. Oh, wow. and he took such care of me and i've never forgot i've never forgotten that each year i had actually want to send him another message i just kind of write and thank him right. yeah so that's how it shift the energy shifted right. because there were people that came because they read the article right and that brought a whole bunch of like truly magical people into my life right yeah was it what <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> I was gonna. I'm gonna. I, I want to ask you. Was it all nice people? Because you know, it's New York and it's the city and it's a park. You know, um, and New York has a. We have a reputation here. Um, yeah, I'm was gonna it say, mostly good? Was it? Were there any awkward moments? I will say this. I have found very few moments that I felt I couldn't handle. I have discovered something about myself. Marco, and this is a new thing I'm discovering. Um, you can make fun of me. You can call me out on things. You can call out my husband and my kids, and I will defend them. But there's one thing that I get really defensive about, and it's New York. Mm. I'm a lifelong New Yorker, right? Born and mm. raised in New York. And I, yes, there are when people hear about New York, and it's the center of New York, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And, and, um, but new yorkers really are beautiful people that's my experience of new yeah. yorkers mm -hmm. and so what i find is we sit in a little area and if you don't know us you might not know you were supposed to be included so yeah. a lot of people walk by and the only kind of rule i have there aren't any rules is if you smile if you acknowledge us i invite you to sit down right and that's everybody everybody who walks by and the thing is you mostly don't know have there been times when there were people um that i felt i needed to guide one way or another yes people who i thought maybe were a little i don't want to say dangerous i never felt in danger but people that felt a little less stable right right i right. would i would sometimes invite them to sit at my end of the table and offer them a cup of tea and then guide them on their way right I mean, there are people, and I, and I'll be honest, right? People talk about post COVID. Mm -hmm. um, for one year, we didn't do the the park. That one summer, we didn't do the park. We did it on Zoom with some regulars. Oh, interesting. But each year, we've gotten at least some in person. Right. And and there's definitely a feeling of unease more mm -hmm. in the city. That is the reality. Right. Um. My dad gave me a gift when I was nine years old, Marco. He was taking me to the to the Madison Square Garden for the horse show right. in the city. And he he taught in Manhattan. And so it was only me. He was taking me in for my birthday. So it was just none of my siblings were there. It was myself and him on the Long Island Railroad into Penn Station. And when we got there, it was really scary, right? Because there's the rush of people on the platform. And I'm holding my dad's hand. And he said, we can just wait till everyone goes. And then we were walking gently through Penn Station. And he stopped 
at a point where there was a person, you know, I guess we would call homeless, right, sitting there, unhoused. And my father walked up to him, and he had money in his hand. But he did something that I didn't realize till later was, was unique. He put the money in the man's hand, but he took the man's hand and clasped both of the man's hands. Wow. And he said, here you go, my friend. And Mark, I'm I'll never forget it. I watched the man's eyes kind of clear for a second and then tear up. Wow. And he said, why did you call me friend? And he wow. said, because you are my friend. And I don't remember any, I don't remember the horse. I don't remember anything else. Wow. I just never forgot that moment. Wow. And so I have found that even people who seem um you know living on the street or on some kind of on edge if you invite them to sit down and have a cup of tea uh even for a little bit you can watch something shift right. when they understand that they're welcome when they understand that they can drink out of a beautiful teacup mm -hmm. yeah but there are a couple of things that i learned and the tea party helped me do that. It's interesting. I talk a lot about my father's story. He was so influential to me as a child, right? He believed in a beloved community. He was very much interested in making systemic change. And my mother was an emergency room nurse in Greenwich Village. So she used to take care of what people used to refer to as the Bowery bums, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever heard that phrase, right? And she would minister to the homeless. Mm. And and they had these very different views of life. My father would talk about systemic change and love. And my mother used to say, you can't change the world. You can only change the person in front of you. That's the only person you can reach. Mm. And I, when I was younger, I loved my father's vision, right? Um, but what I see myself doing, it started out, the tea party started out as my father's, the vision in honor of my dad. But I find myself doing more and more what my mother did like really healing to people by doing that yeah. like my sister was also a nurse at the beginning of the AIDS crisis and I remember like the importance of touching people and I'll tell you a decision I made there were a couple of people who came regularly three of them uh who were unhoused and so during COVID I didn't see them obviously and I didn't mm -hmm. know how they if they survived or anything and then when I was headed in for the first in-person tea party last summer um i'll just say this i'm not I, I don't believe kind of in a god in the sky like a patriarchal god in the sky but when i was a little girl i saw the play fiddler on the roof and i loved i don't know if you've ever seen it no. but the main character just talks to god in this very loving way right you couldn't make me a rich man you know like right, right. and so i talked i had this very kind of dialogue with god all the time right even though i would say my my understanding of kind of the relationship is more complex than that but when I was headed into the city for the first one of the tea party post COVID, I really said to God, if I see any of my friends who have been living on the street, I am going to hug them because they are going to need to be hugged because no one has probably touched them in a year. So I said, whatever you have to do to protect me. Now I was, we were masked. We did right, everything right. right. We were out in the open. And when I when the first gentleman came up and he saw me and I saw him, I did go and I hugged him. Mm. Um, and I think it's exactly what you said. I think we have a dearth, especially live in a big city, a dearth of healthy human touch. Yeah. And healthy human touch is so important. Of course, I asked his permission. I said, "May I hug you?" Right? Like I. Yeah. yeah. But I I think you named something really important. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's tricky too, you know. It's, yes, it's a difficult thing to navigate, you know. Was... Yeah, and and I was, uh, you know, a precaution, and and you know, I was wearing gloves. Mm -hmm. You know, I I tried yeah. to do everything as smart as I could, and um, but I think there there are a couple of things, and I'm looking at your beautiful background. I think a couple of reasons it works is. I think we need beauty, especially in a in a big city, right? Mm. A lot of people aren't really the beauty can be embraced as a as a superficial thing, but I, it isn't a superficial thing mm. to connect in deep beauty. And when people pass by and and there are china cups 
and they're all different, but they're all beautiful. And the tablecloths, and I put, you know, whatever I baked out on lovely platters. I think there's this idea that you can connect with your own beauty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the beauty matters. Yeah, as much as much as the welcoming and the tea and the yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I say something similar in in when it comes to smiles. I I love people's smiles and and some of the most beautiful smiles I've ever seen. These people do not have nice teeth. Some these people sometimes don't even have more than three teeth, you know. But it, it, a smile is much more than 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 the teeth. The smile is it, it's it's the eyes and it's more than anything else. It's the it's the energy, yeah. You know, it's the energy. It's it's how it's conveyed, you know. And and I think that's similar to to what you're saying. I was going to say I think the other thing that intrigues people before they know that everyone is invited in is if you take a look at the table. They're trying to figure out what all those people are doing at the same table <laughs> because right. it's people of very different ages. It's people of very different, obvious and visually, right? Socioeconomic, yeah. different ethnicities. And, and I think when you see us all, I think people stop and stare first because they're trying to say, what has all these people in common? And we do have regulars. There are about 15 to 20 people who show up regularly. But there's every week, there are people who just drop by and maybe have only ever been there once. Mm. Yeah. How many people do you think have been to the tea party total since the beginning? Roughly 20, 25 a day. And and from 17 till COVID, we were doing it weekly because we had an inside home. 20 times 50. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I oh, for 10 years. <laughs> for 10 years, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. 20 times 50, was that a thousand? Yeah. So thousands. No, no, no. That's why. <laughs> I'll edit it out. If I get it wrong, I just put like the word. No, two times five is ten. <laughs> add two zeros. That's right, a thousand. Right, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, thousands. Two thousand people. Wow. Yeah, thousands. Wow. Yeah. Any encounters stand out? Like we talked about, can change your life and can change others. And we talked about the person who put you in contact with the times, and and they did that piece yeah. on, on you and then the tea party. And you talked about the Turkish actor. Are there any encounters that really just stand out for you that, that really had made an impact, something that stays with you even till now? Yeah, I, I if I have to say one person, um, it's my friend Andy. It's my friend Andy because Andy took the tea party to a different level. Was he your friend before that? Nope. I'm going to tell you how. So the tea part, the, the New York Times article ran the end of 2017. My father passed in January of 2018. And so March, I, I always, you know, before we had a winter home and, and I don't, we're not doing indoor events during COVID. So it will be, we'll take that kind of January off. And I say that first 50 degree day in March, I'm at the tea party, right? So it was March of 2018. We started back up again, but in June of 2018, someone walked up to me with this giant tea party hat made of paper. It was huge. It was beautiful. And he said, I found you. And I said, do I know you? And he said, no. But I read the New York Times article, and I thought I saw a kindred spirit. So I took a chance to come by. And I sat with Andy, and he had lost his mom the same month that I'd lost my dad. So we were just talking and serving tea, and he was mostly observing. And Andy gave me, he was the one that coined the term beloved community, T-E-A. He's an artist. And he did this thing that he thought that I would appreciate because it was a similar thing. Every year, Andy, he reclaims literal garbage, right? He dumpster dives and will take out things that have been discarded paper and and high-end fashion bags and and different things and he turns them into hats and when i say hats i'm talking about fancy beautiful hats and during the for for 15 or 16 years i may get that wrong he would spend the whole year making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hats and we keep them in the storage little space in the basement of his tiny apartment and at on easter every year he would go to Fifth Avenue 
with um do you know when you have um in stores they have the racks where they move clothing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. he would have racks yeah, and racks with these hats hanging right. and he would just pass them out to anyone who came to the easter parade for free oh, and they were works of art i mean br beautiful brilliant works of art and he said i do it once a year and i just spend my time just connecting with people and i spend all day easter kind of connecting with the public and in, in this joyful exchange and he said mm -hmm. and when i read that you do this every week i wanted to know you mm -hmm. and and he gave me a metaphor marco and he was the one that really said no we have to keep this going all year and he had worked at bank of america which is right across the street from bryant park and he said, you know, there's an atrium there so we can go there when it's raining, but it's not heated. And then over the skating rink in Bryant Park was a heated place that's now not open to the public. And he went about really tending to the tea party mm -hmm. in a way that I didn't feel like it was me running this thing, that it was he was the person that made me understand that although I showed up with the tea, the plates, the cup and everything, that there was nothing about it that it was about me. Wow. that was when we shifted to being a real community right and there were a bunch of people that came because of the new york times article the ones that stayed uh corey kilgannon was exactly right were the ones who came for the right reason they were seeking that type of community in a city that can seem so unfriendly mm. yeah. and and that core of people are kind of the ones that are still we call ourselves the regulars right, right. and one was a tour guide He's a tour guy. He's a uh, bus tour guide in New York, and and so, but it was Andy who who said that I, and I started to think about when I do work, right? And you see this too. You and I have talked about this. The people you deal with, or not deal with the people you. I'm going to say minister to. That's kind of my language. Mm -hmm. Some of them have been or felt discarded, right? The mm -hmm. or or not seen or not loved. And I got this powerful metaphor, Marco. He literally goes around. And there was one time, do you know cash register receipt tape rolls? Yep, yep. He just found that someone had just thrown those out. They hadn't been used, they were still in plastic. He took a bunch of those, he feathered them and made this hat that looks like this glory. I, I mean, he would take these things that other people had discarded and turn them into things of beauties that you thought, why aren't we always like this? Right. And I thought that's what I want to do with what better looks like the people like with my work. I mm -hmm. want to look at either people, systems, things that either have been discarded or should be discarded and transform mm -hmm. them in ways that make them so much more beautiful mm -hmm. and powerful and the vision of how we want to be living that we wonder why don't we always <laughs> do that? Why haven't mm -hmm. we always done it this way? Yeah. So I would say. I mean, so many magical ones, but Andy's the one that probably shifted us most to the intentionality of community. Right. Yeah. Is there any place or any thoughts of combining the the tea party with the other piece work you do? I mean, because just in the way you're describing it now, I mean, it this is it, it this this is something that the concept can be shared in other cities yes this this could be the ted talk of <laughs> the peace community has there has there ever been any interest in other people doing this in, in other places in other cities yeah it, it is interesting i'm think i think about this a lot i think about this a lot it's funny i was just invited through what better looks like to do a workshop that i do with the girl scouts and the woman who was doing the program i know her her the, her boss I guess and she said ask Liz about the tea party and I told her and I was doing two different storytelling programs with the Girl Scouts one with five to seven year olds and one with nine to twelve year olds and they said would you do the tea party so I brought the cups to the to the workshop mm. and I let the girls pick their tea cup and they were so enchanted right and they got a little baked good I, I have been thinking about modeling it mm. and I think the tricky part I think also what makes it work is it truly echoes that idea of the beloved community. The beloved community is based on the fact that no one's left out, right? When Martin Luther King used to talk about systems, whether that be justice systems, education systems, healthcare systems, the idea of the beloved community is we have to build systems where no one is left out. Right. 
and that's a model we've created at the Tea Party. And that's why I feel authentic using that term, beloved community. No one's left out. Everyone's welcome. Everyone's mm -hmm. included. I, I do think there probably is a way to replicate it. And people have reached out. Like yeah. when I was in just a few weeks ago, a woman was walking by and asked what we were doing. And she said, oh, my God, I just gave away my grandmother's teacups. I could have had a, I had a, I could have had a tea party. Wow. So I think seeds get planted. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, 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 you know, I got a lot of time left. I think we'll probably figure that out. <laughs> and I do think I do try to weave both yeah. the work with the Peace Alliance, my own work with what better looks like and, yeah. and the tea party as I don't see them as separate. It's yeah. all one. It's all one woven cloth. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. So when you think back about now that we know that's thousands of people, was mm -hmm. there anyone? I mean, you, you also spoke about Andy and how he had been looking for you, but are there any other encounters that you had with someone where they really where they reached out to and they really expressed gratitude or this is something that they needed or something that changed them or connected them in some way? Yeah, yeah, a lot of people. I can tell you one one person was walking by. It was when we were it was a rainy day and we were in the atrium across the street at Bank of America, but it's the same tables and the same chairs. And we'd set it up and we had the tea party and a woman just looked through the glass and she had a friend with her. And um, and she walked in and she said, I just wanted to say how lovely those teacups are. And um, and I said, would you like to join us? And she said, are you serious? I said, yeah, would you like to join us? And she kind of had to talk her friend into it a little bit, right? And that, so that's the New so, Yorker right there. That suspicious. is the New Yorker. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so they sat down. And it, it turned out, it, it was interesting. It was a really hard time for her. She's an actress and she worked in New York um, and her husband had recently passed. And so she lost her apartment and she was newly, ho newly homeless. Oh. And she said, one of my great joys was sitting around every day with my husband having a cup of tea. Oh. And we stayed in touch and it turned out that a week after she saw us, she was doing a play reading of a new play she was working on. And we, uh, you know, the, a couple of us from the Tea Party were able to get tickets. And I've stayed in touch with her. She's been back during COVID. Even we didn't see one another. She she went to stay with family out of state. Mm -hmm. um, but but she really said in that moment when I just needed to connect with love and beauty. It, this was there, and 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 we've been there for one another. Mm -hmm. We've been there for one another. Yeah. That's nice. Thank you. I would imagine that just meeting so many people and having these casual, natural encounters and, you know, the topic of, of the podcast, the focus of my work and, and what I do is authenticity. I would imagine that you've seen authenticity in so many different ways in the people that you've met. What are the common threads that you found across the people that you've met? I love this question so much, Marco, and I know that I have expressed to you, I love, authenticity is such a powerful word. And what I realized was I, there was a way that I start, if it's, if someone I don't know shows up, I, I just kind of started asking a question and I don't know what made me ask it the first time, but it's kind of my go-to question and it unlocks exactly what I think you were talking about. And I, I just, if someone sits down and I don't know if we'll ever see them again or whatever. And I always start with, is there something about yourself you'd like me to know? Mm. And what I love about the question is you get, it gets to the key of the authentic self marker because no one has a prepared answer for that. Yeah. We, we meet people all day. People ask us, what do you do? What's your favorite thing? Do you have enough? But, but, but it's not a question people have a prepared answer for. Right. So I find people right away and do you know what's interesting for me? This is the common thread. If you're asking me, I didn't think about it in that term till just now. They want to make a genuine answer to give a genuine, a genuine effort to give a genuine answer to a genuine question. Right. Right. And so I was talking to one guy and I was sitting by myself at the table once and there was a guy a couple of tables away really screaming mm -hmm. into his cell phone, screaming. And I couldn't tell what he was saying. I couldn't hear anything. Uh, it was like a busy day, but he was in distress. Mm -hmm. And as he walked by, I asked him, I just said, it looks like you could use a cup of tea. Can I offer you a cup of tea? And he said, 
yeah, I would like that. <laughs> and we sat down. Um, and all I said is, is there something about yourself you'd like me to know? And he said, yes. He said, my daughter's going through some really difficult mental health issues, and I can't find anyone who can help me. And it's so frustrating. And we just sat. Yeah. You know, we just sat. And he, he brought me his authentic self right away because I asked him an authentic question. Yeah. 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 And you can take that question on any level, right? Of People course. have told me, oh my God, I love gardening. Yeah. Or, but I find they give you, they really take their time and they give you a genuine question, uh, answer because they recognize that you've asked them a genuine question. Yeah. 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 What are the most important lessons that you feel you've learned so far in, in all of these encounters that you've had with people? I will tell you one thing. And as I said, you know, you go each week and each encounter pushed you forward. Yeah. But but a gentleman said something. A friend of mine, I had done some workshops with him, and he brought a friend of his to the table, and his friend was a rabbi. And we were sitting th there for a while. And he he at one point he said, This feels like Shabbat dinner. Mm. This feels like right. And from that moment on, I never didn't think of it that way. Mm. I thought this is a sacred space. Mm. And I try to make it a sacred space. And I always was intentional about creating the space. But then I was more content about that idea that when, when you claim something as sacred space, right. it makes it a little different. And so it's that, the importance of, of that deep intentionality. And the other thing that I had a friend just named for me recently, <laughs> Marco, and I'm grappling with it because have you ever had the experience of someone reflecting back to you the way they see you and it doesn't match how you see yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, in positive and mm -hmm, negative ways, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. of course. but I was talking to a friend recently and they, I just sought out some advice and they reflect, they said something to me and I said, um, thank you for that. You made me, you made me brave. Mm. And this person is not a New Yorker, right? And this, this friend said to me, you think you need someone to make you brave? Mm. She said, for years, you sit in the middle of what some people might think the most dangerous city in the world. And you serve tea to everyone who walks by and you welcome it. She said, you think you need help being brave? Like, that's so brave. And it never occurred to me to think that that was a brave thing to do. Sure. Well, in New York, we won't. We don't use the word brave. We call it no. we say crazy. We say crazy, like girl, you crazy. You telling me? No, you're so that's you sitting up with strangers, giving them tea out your own cups. <laughs> and it's yeah. So it's funny. So to me, and I, and this is the other thing. I will just say this. This is another intentionality, because I wanted people to feel comfortable drinking out of like a Limoges china cup mm -hmm. in the park, because a lot of times people get concerned. They're like, what if it breaks? And I always say to them, every year something breaks. Yeah. And behind me, underneath the table, like right behind me, I have a giant thing of broken cups and saucers. And the plan, and I think because next year is our 10th year, and Andy is an artist, and we have a whole bunch of artists, I always said to them, I'm saving the pieces, and we're going to turn it into a mosaic. Nice. So I said, so if nothing breaks, you've drunk had a drink out of this beautiful cup. But yeah. if it does, the worst thing that's going to happen is it's going to become a piece of art. Nice. Yeah, that's cool. I, I'm, I'm, I'd love to see. What, yeah, I want to see what that turns out to be. Yeah, well, I'll let you know when we start working on yeah. it. Maybe you could oh. break away. So that's it. So I would say what I've learned over the years about myself and about that is, um, oh, I'll quote a friend. My husband made a short film years ago on peace building. And there was a gentleman named Tenny Gross, and he he does peace building under tough circumstances. He's worked with gang members. He's currently working in Chicago. And when my husband asked him, when my husband asked him if there's anything he, um, any last words he wanted to say, he said, if you're going to inspire hope in people, you had better be there when they need you. So I think for me, there has to be that intentionality of showing up. There are days I don't feel like getting up. And don't feel like baking and don't feel like getting on the train and getting into the city. But when you know that there are people in a community that's very mutual, like it's this beautiful mutual community and that people are counting on you. And it, yeah, that's what keeps me going. Wow. 
Yeah. What does authenticity mean to you? For me, Marco, what I've come to understand about myself, I feel like every two-year-old comes to you with who they are, right? And and a friend and a friend recently said that other people put masks on you. It's not necessarily that you put masks on yourself, right? That we we yeah. build these things. And then I think we spend a lot of time trying to get back to who we knew we were when we were two. Right. And so for me, authenticity is when you strip away everything that isn't who or what you came to the planet to be. And I and we could name it. I'll give you a true example. When I started doing what better looks like, uh, when we built up the tenants, one of the ideas came from my husband. And he said he felt everyone came to the planet to be a healer, an artist, or a teacher, or some combination of the three. Right. I think of the acronym HAT, healer, artist, teacher. Okay. Yeah. So when that worked, I asked people, really, one of the workshops revolves around asking people, what do you think you're here to heal, create, or teach? Oh. Right? And when I started this work, my boys, who are now 23 and 20, almost 21, were five and eight. And I asked my eight-year-old, what do you think you came to heal, create, or teach? And he said, I came to heal anger. There are too many angry people on this planet. Oh. And my five-year-old, said, I came to teach people we have to stop killing gorillas. And I don't know why that mattered to him so much. Right? But we all know that when you talk to a two-year-old, they are authentically themselves. And for me, authenticity is just remembering who we were when we were two. Yeah. 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 And, and, and creating new connections was so simple back then. You know, I remember watching my kids when they were, <laughs> when they were a little bit younger. You know, my, my, my daughter's 10 and my son is 15 right now. Yeah. Um, but when they were younger, it you know, they reminded me how easy it was to make friends. How easy was it? You're literally in the park. You walk up to a kid. They say, hey, do you want to be my friend? Like, yeah, okay, okay, you're my friend now. And then they go and they introduce you to the parents. Like, yeah. hey, this is so-and-so. He's my new friend. Like, okay, yeah. okay, and that's it, you know. And and then hence, you know, we shared the, the new yeah. experience. Where yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it's so true. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. walking by people in the street, I you know, say good morning because I'm so used to saying good morning at work. It's like, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's like everything, it's like reflex. There's no thought involved anymore. It's just greeting everyone with good morning. And so sometimes I'm outside and like good morning, and then you get like that look like, man, do I know you? <laughs> so I will tell you, uh, someone, someone said something that was so true. It was a person who only attended one tea party and he was from the South. Mm. And we were sitting there and we were having this lovely conversation and he was living in the North now. And he said, and I was I was talking about that idea that people have this idea of what New Yorkers are and, and who we are. And I said, I, I think we're busy and New York is difficult citizenry, right? Because it's crowded and people rush by you. It's exactly what you said. And he said, what I find in New York is if I'm on the subway and I'm carrying seven bags and I get to the bottom of the steps and I'm struggling. Six people will grab my bags, walk them to the top of the steps, put them down. They don't want to know how my day is. They don't ask me about my aunt, but they'll carry the bags up the steps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, where I'm from, <laughs> if I'm walking around carrying seven bags, someone might come up to me and say, how you doing, honey? And I'll say, well, I'm carrying these seven bags. And they'll say, yeah, you are, and walk away. <laughs> And that rings true for me. And I'm not saying that as the generation. Yeah. I love everybody. But New Yorkers, I feel like if you can get us to slow down enough, and that's the beauty of the Tea Party. If you can get us to slow down enough, we can be human to one another. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but that's the key. And that's why I said, I think if I was handing out tea in paper cups, it wouldn't be the same. Yeah. You have to slow down enough to sit at the Tea Party. Yeah, yeah and th th this is the best place to do a Tea Party. It's, it's so, <laughs> I know. It's, it's, which it's, it's, New York is just like that. It's, I mean, I love New York. I can't imagine myself living anywhere else. It's a love hate relationship, App without it's a doubt. A love -hate without a doubt. You know, and like it's you, hard. You, you have your bad days, and you're just like, I mean, you know, at this place, I'm gonna leave. You know, like, uh, then you're able to go to a store at ten o'clock at night. You know, and it's like, All right, yeah. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll stick around for a little bit longer. <laughs> and then you deal, you find things you come across unexpectedly. You know, things like yeah. the tea party when you're in the train station, the live music. You know. Yeah. Um, People outside, they just put the radio on. Now it's on their cell phones. People just start dancing in the street. Like, yeah, yeah. That's my people. That, that's that's it. It comes down to that. Like exactly kind of the theme of the talk, right? What are the unexpected encounters? Yeah. Because where I live now, I live on Long Island. 
and everyone gets in their car and they drive when they drive wherever they're going and you don't have as many unexpected encounters it, oh. that is the beauty it's exactly what you named as the theme of talk right yeah. you have so many unexpected encounters in new york and it's kind of how you especially if you sit there on purpose and just say yeah i'm here yeah yeah. And to people watching or listening to this who are not from New York, it ain't bad here. <laughs> it's like every place else. You know, you gotta use your like you gotta be smart else. about it, you know. You do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you gotta you gotta lock your doors out here. But it's, yes, it's that's cool, we that right? we do. That yeah. We do. But it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. So um what do you want to share? One final message, and then I want you to tell us a little bit about how people can get in sure. contact with you or maybe to, to donate to the tea party or the work that you do or to find out more about the peace projects yeah um, but hit me with like some some words of wisdom for whoever's listening to this um about anything about authenticity about peace about encounters um what do you feel yeah for me like to share? yeah for me i'm going to share that that thing i've really been weighing is that balance between the lesson of my father and the lesson of my mother right that um that there's this the fast i, I will tell this I have a couple of teachers that taught me in peace building, and both of them said some version of the fastest way to change the world is to change the story that we tell. Mm. And so for me, the story that I can sit in New York and create this space in this way, it's such an unexpected story, right? <laughs> like people. Um, so to me, think about the story you're here to tell and what could you switch, right? How, what, how would you change the story? The story is everyone's too busy. Everyone is, or the world people are horrible or like we can change the story and starts just by what's the better story you'd like to tell wow. so for me that's it and it's interesting to me right I, I I I have two organizations like I said that are my heart and soul and one is you can find it what better looks like dot org mm -hmm. and we do work one of my co-founders is from Rwanda so we do both local work but also a project in Rwanda and you can find that out and Peace Alliance, one word, right? Peacealliance.org. Um, but what's interesting for me, and this is the last thing I'll probably say to you, is if people want to come to the tea party and share and bring tea or bring cups or whatever, like I accept that, but I really, I've just drawn this line that I don't accept donations for the tea party because to me, it's my gift. Right. It's kind of my gift to the beloved community. I can sit, I can show up. And, and it's my gift. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to come and, and be in person and do something, I we always, I, I say, bring something to share. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's kind of the philosophy. Show up, be here and share what you have. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, Liz, thank you so much for being a part of it. <laughs> I'm so always, grateful. I know, it's always so beautiful talking to you. And, and yeah. we, we've had coffee and tea. Um, <laughs> we sure not, have. At the, not at the tea party, but we, we've no, had no. coffee and tea a few times. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and our conversation's always great. And, and yeah. uh, I'm so grateful to you and appreciative to you. Oh, um, back at you. And uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, that, that's our episode for today. I really hope you enjoy this uh, conversation that you found it enlightening. And it encourages you to go out and to just start a conversation with someone as long as you feel comfortable and safe with it. Um, and do something that's pretty neutral, you know, like uh, offer someone a cup of tea uh, <laughs> or just a simple good morning or a hello. Uh, yeah. So once again, my name is Marco Benitez, also known as Coach Marco B. I'm an authenticity coach and I help people to live unapologetically the, themselves the way they want when to feel okay with the things that they want so they can reduce their stress and live a life that's inspiring to them and others. Uh, so I'll leave you with the quote of Jim Carrey, which is, you could fail at something you don't want, so you might as well take a chance at something you love. And remember to mind your business, the business of being you. <laughs> I love it. Take care.